I love Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I always have. It's my favourite Star Trek show. Deep Space Nine is an interesting animal. Along with Babylon 5, it was one of the first sci-fi shows to really embrace the kind of serialised storytelling that is the norm today. But at the same time, it was very much a product of its time in the 90s, where we had seasons of about 24 episodes a year. And of course, along with that came a lot of filler. A couple of years ago, I did a complete rewatch of Deep Space Nine on Netflix. It was the first time I'd actually watched the show in any form other than VHS. From time to time, I think, you know, it'd be fun to go back and do another rewatch of DS9. But I can never quite bring myself to, to take the time to watch the entire thing, because there's so much other stuff that needs to be watched. Now, I read an interesting article on the internet a while back. It was a kind of a thought experiment. The idea was to take Deep Space Nine and try and condense it down to what would be kind of the equivalent of a modern serialised streaming TV show, where it had a much shorter season and it was a lot more closely serialised, so you wouldn't have all of the filler kind of episodes, you wouldn't have a lot of standalone episodes. And it was a really interesting article and it really got me thinking. So I thought it might be fun to do something similar to that myself. Now, I don't remember what episodes they had on their list, so I've made my own list completely from scratch. Now, this is not a list of the very best of Deep Space Nine. There are some really fantastic episodes that are not on the list I'm about to show you. And there's some episodes on this list that, you know, maybe are not as good as some of the others. But that's not the point. What I was trying to do here is tell a story. I wanted to take the whole of Deep Space Nine and I wanted to condense it down into something that would that would have a story arc that would be serialised all the way through and, and tell a story. It may not be the complete set of stories that the original DS9 told, but that, that's kind of what I wanted to try and do. The way I went about this, you know, I, I wanted to actually divide it, I wanted to create seasons as well. So not every season has to have the exact same number of episodes, but I wanted to try as closely as possible to have each season be, you know, within the range that we would usually see on a streaming show today. So, you know, kind of 10 to 13 kind of episodes a season. So that's what I was trying to do. So let's have a look at what I've come up with. This list may not be perfect, might be able to improve it still some more, but this is what I've got. So here we are at season one, and I've titled this season, Bajor Recovers from the Occupation. And if you're really astute, you may have already noticed that there are episodes here from both the original Season 1 and the original Season 2. I've taken Seasons 1 and 2 of DS9, and I've compacted both of them down to a single 13-episode season. The arc of this new Season 1 is all about Bajor recovering from the occupation and finding its new place in the galaxy after the withdrawal of the Cardassians, the discovery of the wormhole, and the arrival of the Federation. So let's see what we've got. Obviously, we're going to start with Emissary. This is the first episode of Deep Space Nine, this is the pilot, and it actually surprisingly sets up quite a lot uh, for the whole rest of the show. Next, we have Past Prologue. Now, I've included this because it's important for Kira's arc. This is really when she starts to accept that the Federation presence may be a good thing and not a bad thing. And it's also very much exploring the reaction of Bajor to the withdrawal of the Cardassians and the arrival of the Federation. I've included the episode Dax, uh, because this is a very important character episode for Dax's character. It explains a lot about what a trill is, how they work, all that kind of thing. So this, this seemed uh, an important inclusion from a character point of view. The next one we have is Battle Lines. And this is, of course, where we leave Kaio Parker. Uh, she essentially leaves the show at this point, and this kind of sets up a lot of what will be happening throughout the rest of this season, so it's quite an important one. And again, it also has some uh, nice character moments for Kira. Duet. I do believe that this fits quite nicely into this compacted, serialised season. This again is all about the Cardassians learning to acknowledge their mistakes during the occupation, and the Bajorans learning to extend the hand of friendship and even forgiveness to the Cardassians. In the hands of the prophets, 
So this one introduces Vedic Win and Vedic Burial. This one kind of sets in motion the, the political and religious intrigue that will continue through the rest of the season. And it's it, it's all happening in response to the loss of Kaya Parker. Uh, we now need to find a new Kaya. Now, this really helps to give this combined season a real feeling of serialization because we've got three episodes here that just directly follow one from each other. They were, of course, the original three-parter at the beginning of the original season two. It made a lot of sense to include these. It's all about finding some Bajoran prisoners who've never been released. One of them turns out to be a great hero of the occupation. And that leads to all sorts of political intrigue on, in the Bajoran government and on the station. I believe it also introduces the relationship between Kira and Boreal, which is kind of useful, seeing as though that'll be coming up again later. And it kind of culminates in this siege situation. And again, we've got Vedic Wynn pulling strings in the background. So it's all tied into this, this season arc. It's also quite important to introduce the Marquis, who will be quite important for much of the rest of Deep Space Nine. So we've got the Marquis Part 1 and Part 2. The Collaborator, this kind of brings to a conclusion the Season 1 arc, in a sense. All of the Bajoran political intrigue stuff. You know, we find out who is going to be the new Kai. And it takes one last look back at Kai Opaka and who she really was and all that kind of stuff. And then we have our Season 1 finale, which of course is the Gem Hadar. So throughout the course of this season, Bajor has finally come to terms with their new position uh, next to the wormhole and all the benefits that that has brought. But now we realise, well, hey, hang on a minute. This wormhole also introduces a threat from the Gamma Quadrant. And that's where we leave our first season. Season 2 I have called Rise of the Dominion. And this is pretty much based on season three of the original show. So of course we start with the search, part one and part two, where we discover who the founders of this new dominion that we've discovered are. Uh, Odo is reunited with his people. Second skin, now I wasn't going to include this one. This might seem like a, an unusual addition, but this sets up another episode that happens later in the show and one that I needed to include for other reasons which we'll get to. But that episode makes no sense without this one, so it seemed important to include Second Skin in my Season 2. Uh, then we've got The Abandoned, again continuing the season-wide arc of the Rise of the Dominion. Odo comes into possession of an infant Jem'Hadar. We learn a lot more about their species uh, and how the Dominion works internally. Now, Civil Defense. Now, this was kind of one that I kind of put in just to fill in a slot. There were quite a few contenders for this position. I don't actually remember completely why I decided that this was an important one to use. It does have some good um, stuff that explores the relationship between Garrick and Goldacut, which is very useful, and I wasn't able to include the episode Cardassians in the previous season, so, you know, this this is kind of filling in a gap that that would have filled. I have a feeling there was something else important that was introduced in here. It may have been a Nog moment. This, I believe, does introduce the fact that Jake does not want to be in Starfleet, um, and eventually we find that he wants to be a writer. Defiant. Again, I wasn't going to include this one, but then, you know, it is continuing the Marquis thing, but more importantly, it's setting up something that's going to happen uh, in just a few episodes. So this is a nice foreshadowing episode of what's to come. Life Support. This basically brings to a close the whole Bajoran religious kind of thing from the previous season, and sadly brings an end to Vedic Burial, um, with his death and the end of his relationship with Kira. So that seemed logical to include that. Heart of Stone, again, is a Dominion episode. We learn more about Odo's uh, reasons for not siding with his people and some relationship stuff between Odo and Kira is kind of foreshadowed here. Destiny. This one is another one that you might wonder why I included. This is part of Cisco's character arc throughout the show. This is the first time that he really begins to, not quite embrace yet, but at least show more interest in his role as emissary. It's the first step towards him embracing that role. And so for that reason, it seemed important to include this one. Now, Improbable Cause is the beginning of the big epic two-parter. Um, which was foreshadowed in Defiant. This is where we find that the Cardassians and the Romulans are invading the, uh, the Gamma Quadrant, invading the Dominion. 
and well we know how well that goes so that was very much foreshadowed and this feels like a real kind of almost culmination of our rise of the dominion season and we're ending the exact same way that season three of the original ended with the adversary the dominion now have been observing us they've been learning about us we've been learning about them but now we learn that they're, they're starting to take initiative against us and we learn here that their preferred method of dealing with us is not so much a military conquest, but it's a manipulation. They want to manipulate powers in the Alpha Quadrant to pit them against each other. So that is uh, an important thing that will lead into Season 3, which I have titled The Klingon Manipulation. Now, I was just going to call it The Klingon Conflict, but then I thought about it, and while, yes, the, the conflict really is with the Klingons throughout this season... Uh, really, when you look at it, um, it is the Dominion behind the scenes that are pulling all the strings and manipulating the situation and pitting the Klingons on Federation against each other. So I think that makes a good season title for this. So we begin, of course, with Way of the Warrior, which introduces this whole manipulation with the Klingons. Uh, for the first time since the original series, the Klingons are now hostile towards us, so they're our enemy. And of course, it introduces Worf into DS9, which was pretty darn cool. Uh, then we go to Indiscretion. Now, I've included this because, again, it's foreshadowing um, a lot of stuff that's going to happen throughout this season. The next season, with the cut, with his character, it's, it's positioning him where he needs to be for the future storylines. And it also introduces the character of Zial. Next, we have Homefront. This uh, brings us back to Earth. In Homefront, we see kind of the, the consequences of this manipulation that the Dominion are doing. And then in Paradise Lost, we kind of realise that, uh, you know, our fear of that may actually be you know, just as uh, more, just as dangerous an enemy as the Dominion themselves. Uh, Return to Grace, this again continues that arc for Ducat and is very much tied into the Klingon conflict. Um, this kind of moves, he, moves his piece along the board, uh, further setting him up for where things are going to go next season with his character. And... It brings Yal to the station. Rules of Engagement is another important Klingon episode. We're seeing how this tension between the Klingons and the Federation is continuing to happen and how it affects Worf as a character. For the cause. So this is continuing the whole Marquis thing, the fall of Ennington, and how this affects uh, Cisco's relationship with Cassidy. Now this is interesting because this is actually the first time you're going to see Cassidy Yates. She, well, Cisco's relationship with her was first introduced um, in the previous season in uh, it was a Ferengi episode and I just could not bring myself to include that episode solely for that moment so this might be a bit weird where this you know, Cisco suddenly got this girlfriend that came out of nowhere but I guess you'll just have to kind of see it that you know, off camera along the way he's developed this relationship that we just haven't seen started but obviously here she is he's got a relationship with her to the death, so this is uh, an important Dominion episode not so much tied with their manipulation with the Klingon stuff, but it's very important because he introduces Wayoon. And what would Deep Space Nine be without Wayoon? I mean, seriously. The Quickening. Now, this was one that I, again, it was like a slot filler. Where I had a whole bunch that were in contention for this. I chose The Quickening because it shows just how nasty the Dominion can be. And this does get called back to um, in a much later season, so... That's why this is here. Body parts. Now, this must seem like a really weird inclusion. And I just talked about how I just didn't want to include that other Frankie episode just for the, the Cassidy stuff. This one I did end up including because this introduces the whole concept of the O'Brien's baby being implanted in Kira. And if you don't get that introduced here then that whole thing which is going to go through the next season is just going to be so weird. You're not going to know what's going on. And as Ferengi episodes go, this is an interesting one. It's not so bad, and it does have some interesting character stuff for Quark. So, you know, if I'm going to include one silly Ferengi episode, it might as well be this one. Broken Link. Uh, this, of course, was uh, the uh, season finale in the original DS9 Season 4. And... This brings us into the Gamma Quadrant. We finally get their response to Odo killing a fellow changeling at the end of the previous season. And they implant in him the thought that Gowron is a changeling. 
Now, you might be very interested to see that I have actually moved Apocalypse Rising into this season as a season finale. This, of course, is meant to be the, the season premiere of the following season. Now, I did this because I thought Broken Link just it wasn't really a really strong season finale. It was a good episode, but it never really felt like it was strong as a finale. And there's just some really nice uh, kind of bookending going on here. If you look at Way of the Warrior, it introduces the Klingon conflict, it introduces the character of Martok, and then Apocalypse Rising is when we find out that Martok is in fact a changeling, and we find out that all of these problems with the Klingons are the result of Dominion manipulation. And it's very eye-opening to Garon, who says he will try to put an end to the fighting, because he doesn't want to hand the Alpha Quadrant to the Dominion any more than the Federation do. So, yeah, I think there's some really nice symmetry just by using Apocalypse Rising as my Season 3 finale. That brings us to Season 4, The Road to War. Now, without Apocalypse Rising as a premiere, I've actually taken the episode Nor, Nor the Battle to the Strong and I've moved it up a couple of slots. Technically, this episode is meant to happen after looking for Palmer in, in all the wrong places, but I think it works. Uh, this is a fairly standalone contained episode focusing on Bashir and Jake. And this this kind of follows on nicely from Apocalypse Rising where Garon says he's going to try and put an end to the fighting. This one shows he hasn't quite succeeded. But by the end of this episode, the fighting is beginning to die down and we're seeing that the, the Klingon conflict is basically coming to an end. So I've got that as my Season 4 premiere. The ship. So this takes us into the Gamma Quadrant, uh, it introduces some conflict with a Vorta, and it introduces the question of of trust. You know, is there a time when you can trust an enemy? And the road to war is all about the breakdown of that potential trust. And of course, it also introduces a ship which will be referenced heavily next season. Looking for Parmark in all the wrong places. You might be surprised that I included this. It's a comedic Ferengi episode. But it also introduces the relationship between Worf and Dax, who will, of course, eventually marry. You really need this episode for the future of their relationship to make sense, because this is where it started. The Assignment. Now, this is also a one that introduces something important. This introduces, for the very first time, the Par Wraiths. So again, they're going to be vitally important uh, in the kind of end of the war arc in the final season, so we really need to introduce them here. Rapture. Now this is very much tied into the season arc of my season four. This is where Cisco starts having visions of the future, and he starts prophesying about things that are going to happen later in the season. Um, very much important, very much makes this feel like, a, like an arc kind of season. The Begotten. So this is when Odo gets his powers back. It's got some nice character moments with him and Dr. Mora. I did not include the previous Dr. Mora episode. So this is Mora's only appearance in my Deep Space Nine. And again, you know, that is an important enough character transition moment for Odo that I felt it needed to be in here. For the uniform continues our Eddington stuff with the Marquis and Cassidy and all of that kind of stuff. So this is, of course, where Cisco captures Eddington. And this is going to lead directly into another episode later in the season. In Purgatory Shadow, this is what we were setting up all that time with Dukat. This is where we see the Cardassians, who have kind of become a really broken people, joining the Dominion, Dukat becoming their leader, uh, and of course also features the escape from the Dominion prison camp, which is going to be referred back to quite a lot in the future. Dr. Bashir, I presume? This is, of course, a lot of fun because it introduces uh, Robert Picardo's Dr. Lewis Zimmerman and the holographic Doctor from Voyager. But more importantly, this is a vital character moment for Bashir because this is where we learn that he's genetically engineered, and that's going to come up a lot in the rest of Deep Space Nine. Ties of Blood and Water. Now, this episode is the reason that I introduced Second Skin in an earlier season. This is, of course, our second to Kenny Gamore episode. And the reason I included this is because it's actually kind of important to the lead up to the Dominion War arc. You know, this is where we reintroduce Wayun. We learn that 
the Vorta are clones, and so we, we meet the new clone of Wayun. We get to see Wayun and Ducat working together for the first time. So it's it's quite important for that that arc. Blaze of Glory brings an end to the Marquis plot, and it shows us the main reason why I wanted to include the Marquis stuff in 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 my condensed in base nine is because of this episode. It really shows us the consequences of this new alliance between the Cardassians and the Dominion. So the Dominion wipe out the Marquis, and they could do the same to the Federation if we're not careful. In the cards is a bit of a light-hearted moment before things go really bad, and I've included this because, again, it it, it brings Dukat and Wayun to the station. It's, it's very much... It's all about, you know, all the characters know war is coming and they're all depressed about it. And it also introduces the story element of whether Bajor should sign the non-aggression pact or not. Now that was something that was heavily foreshadowed back in Rapture, where Picard prophesies that Bajor must stand alone. So, you know, it's a really nice kind of flowing arc going through this season with that stuff. And then of course we end with a call to arms, which is the beginning of the Dominion War. This is the end of the road, we're now at war. Season 5 obviously is the Dominion War. Now my previous Seasons have all been around the 13 episode mark. This season and the next season are both uh, 17 episodes each. This is harder because these two seasons are so all they're so heavily serialized already. So it was actually quite easy to come up with the the lists for these because I just had to take out anything that wasn't vital to this arc. So you know we're left with the the awesome uh, arc at the beginning. Of the Dominion War, where the station's under Dominion control and all of this stuff. I've included that entire arc because you've got to have that entire arc. Culminates with Sacrifice of Angels, where Federation retake the station. Worf and Dax getting married, important character moment that kind of needed to be there. Statistical improbabilities is important because it's all about what happens next with the war. The war's not over, where's it going to go, and is the war winnable? So this is pretty important. Waltz is a very important character moment for Ducat and very much sets up where his character is going for the rest of the show. Far Beyond the Stars, a very powerful episode. But surprisingly, it really is tied in with the war. It's very much about Cisco. You know, he's he's been fighting a war, carrying the Alpha Quadrant on his shoulders, it feels like, for six months now. And this is about the Prophet sending him a vision to help him come to terms with that, and learn that, well, he needs, needs to keep fighting, basically. Change of Heart is another very important Worf and Dax episode, and again, it is very much tied into the Dominion War. Inquisition is also tied into the Dominion War, and introduces, for the very first time, of course, Section 31, which is fantastic. In the Pale Moonlight, well, of course, this is going to be in there. This is uh, one that many say is the best episode of Deep Space Nine ever made, and it is vital to the war arc because this is when the Romulans join the war. Um, His Way is one you might not have expected me to include, but I felt, you know, again, this is one of those character arc moments where it begins the Odo Kira relationship, and it also introduces Vic Fontaine. So it seemed important to include this one. And it's probably the only light-hearted episode in the entire season, so... Yeah, I'll let, I'll let the audience have one light-hearted moment, sure. The Reckoning. This is not so much tied in with the Dominion War, but it's important with the whole Par Wraith religious kind of arc that is also going out, growing throughout this show, and kind of becomes intrinsically tied to the Dominion War in next season. The sound of her voice is all about the characters Again, reflecting on how hard it is for them to live through this war and how they really need to come together as colleagues and friends in order to help each other get through this this war. And then Tear of the Prophet, Tears of the Prophets is the season finale in the original and here as well. Um, and this is where we see you know, what has become of Descartes, um, how he's now getting involved with the Par Wraiths. Now that actually is what begins to tie the Par Wraith arc and the Dominion War arc uh, kind of intrinsically together. So that's all quite important. And our final season, season six, I've called this The Dominion War Intensifies because I wanted every season to have a distinct name. 
And again, you know, it's it's pretty much all the important episodes. Uh, Image in the Sand and Shattered Symbols continues the war arc and introduces Esri Dax. So we, we've got to have those. Treachery, Faith and the Great River is important because we learn about the virus that is infecting the Dominion. Siege of AR-558, you know, one of the greatest and one of the most important episodes. Um, this is very much an examination of the war and how it's affecting people. It's Only a Paper Moon follows directly from that. Uh, this is very much Nog's character reacting to what happened to him in the previous episode. And it's fantastic television and it's quite important to his character arc. But it, 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 it's like a microcosm of what's happening to the whole Federation. Bada bing, bada bang kind of follows on directly from that as well. Again, this is not a Dominion episode. Um, I do like it. It's it's that one light-hearted moment that I'm letting you have in the entire season. Inter Armor Enem Silent Legus um, continues the Section 31 stuff and kind of leads us into the final however many there are. And this is just, you know, this is what they called the final chapter and I've just included all of that basically because of course you would this is all arc stuff so that brings us down to what you leave behind our series finale so that is my condensed t space nine is it perfect no i may make tweaks to this in the future but it seems a fun thought experiment so if you watch the show through like this you know it may feel much more like a modern serialized streaming show and to be honest, I'm kind of kind of excited now to go back and watch the show this way. So yeah, we'll call this the Adam Cut of Star Trek D Space Nine. I just thought it would be interesting to share this. I hope you found it interesting and entertaining. And maybe you might want to try watching the show this way yourself sometime. Just, just to, as a different way of experiencing D Space Nine. <laughs>